I've always been interested in telling a story of Abraham Lincoln. He's one of the most compelling figures in American history and in my life, certainly from childhood, when I first was taken at four or five years old to see the Lincoln Memorial, and at first was terribly frightened by the immensity of the statue. And as I got closer, I was completely captivated by the comfort I found in looking at his face. It was a warmth and a safety. I felt really safe as a little boy looking at him. I never forgot that moment. Abolishing slavery by constitutional provision settles the fate for all coming time. I knew there had been 14,000 books written about Lincoln, but I just had the, hopefully, the courage to think that somewhere, if I spend enough time, I'll come up with a fresh angle. So when I started, I thought I would write about Abe and Mary's relationship. And I began to see, as I was reading about Lincoln's day-to-day -day activities, that he was spending even more time with the members of his cabinet than he was with Mary. Thunder forth, God of war. And then when I realized they had all kept diaries, they had all written hundreds of letters to their wives, then I knew that this is the story I wanted to tell, especially because they had been his rivals for the Republican nomination. So it allowed me to show him through their eyes in a way that hadn't been used quite the same way before. The people elected me to represent them, to lead them, and I lead. You ought to try it. When Doris told me during a Millennium Project that I was doing for CBS and the White House, I asked her what she was doing, and she said she was writing the story of the Lincoln presidency. And I immediately asked her, could I possibly, even before the book is written, reserve the movie rights? And action. The very first time I had any contact with the Steven Spielberg universe uh, was with Kathy Kennedy, who called me after Angels in America. My play had been turned into a TV miniseries by Mike Nichols and HBO. And I said, what are you guys working on now? And she said, we're working on two films. One is about the murder of the Israeli Olympic athletes in Munich, and the other is about Abraham Lincoln. And that's where it started, and as it turned out, I wound up writing Munich and also Lincoln. No one's ever been loved so much by the people. You might do anything now. Don't, don't waste that power on an amendment bill that's sure of defeat. Tony plunged himself into reading, as Daniel Day-Lewis did, so many books about Lincoln's life. There are so many different Rashomon-like points of view about Abraham Lincoln. And uh, Tony took it all in. They knew that this was going to be a process of not only taking Doris's incredible book, Team of Rivals, but also recognizing that they were going to be embarking on a history lesson to try to find where the focus might be for Lincoln's story. Well, at first, Tony and I attempted to do the book, the entire presidency. And Tony did an amazing job. He wrote 550-page screenplay, first draft. And I have a picture of myself sitting in my backyard, which I sent to Tony when he first sent me the script. It was this thick. And it was in a huge binder. And I just sat there with a Cheshire Cat smile on my face, holding this in my hand. Before ever reading it, I knew, unless I went to HBO for a miniseries, this was not going to be a motion picture called Lincoln. It just couldn't be. So I thought that the most compelling thing that Tony had written was a 70-page stretch of the fight to pass the 13th Amendment on the floor of the House of Representatives. It had already passed in the Senate. And over the course of the next three years of work, especially once Daniel came in, it became clearer and clearer to Stephen, I think, that that was the movie. Well, we focused only on the last four months of Lincoln's life because we wanted to show Lincoln accomplishing something great, something really monumental, and that was abolishing slavery and ending the Civil War. However, we also wanted to show that he was a man, not a monument, and that our best hope of understanding and doing justice to this immensely complicated person was to depict him beginning and then conducting and then concluding a very, very complex action, which was the fight to pass the 13th Amendment. By choosing the last four months of the war, you get not only a beginning, a middle, and end to an incredibly thrilling question of whether the 13th Amendment is going to pass the Congress, but you also get Lincoln. You get his interior fighting with himself. You get the people around him, the people he trusts, and you get his political skills. Absolute front center stage in this battle. Two years ago, I proclaimed these people emancipated. Then. 
thenceforward and forever free. Lincoln first signed the Emancipation Proclamation as a war document. The only reason it was legal was that he could argue that slaves were being used by the Confederates to help in the military battles. The Emancipation Proclamation was handy at the time. It was very shaky, even of questionable legality. Once the war came to an end, what would happen to the slaves? Would they no longer have this legal right underneath them that the Emancipation Proclamation had provided? So then he knew the next phase had to be the 13th Amendment. I'd like to get the 13th Amendment through the House and on its way to ratification by the states, wrap the whole slavery thing up forever and I as soon as I'm able now. We also wanted to be able to include Lincoln's family dynamic, but only at the moments in which they actually collided with the public events that this whole story is about. If you fail to acquire the necessary votes, what will do you, sir? You will answer to me. In such a rich way, through his intellect, through his humor, through his melancholy, you see somebody whose life is lived at one and the same time in that strange paradox of public and private. I think it was the right idea because it gives some focus to the character. It puts the character squarely in a historical context. It's a good way to avoid the cliché, Lincoln, the cartoonish, old, honest Abe. I can't listen to this anymore. Well, I think many people understand that almost any role that Daniel Day-Lewis plays, he goes through a total immersion, and I think this was no exception. He wanted to spend a great deal of time prior to shooting in reading and understanding who Lincoln might have been. It's the man himself that invites you because he was so open. And that was one of the most beautiful surprises of getting to know him was how insanely accessible that man was. At the time, it was actually physically very dangerous, in his case, to be accessible. It's late, Mrs. Keckley. All she needs is for the grand reception. In many cases, when we were casting parts, we were looking in part for people who might have looked like their counterparts, but we didn't make that a final reason for casting them. The fortunate thing was we had this amazing group of actors that were coming out of primarily the stage in New York. So right away, that became very focused predominantly with theater actors. But Sally playing Mary was Stephen's first choice. Mrs. Lincoln. Madam President, if you please. Maybe seven years ago, Stephen came up to me at some place and asked me if I'd be Mary. And I literally started to cry and said, oh my God, yes. But the years went by, we had a reading of it, and then Daniel had come on board. And then I thought, now it's not gonna happen for me. He wants to listen to a useless woman grouse about a carriage accident. I do. Stuff. I am 10 years older than Daniel. Mary was 10 years younger than Lincoln. But through the incredible generosity of two people, Steven Spielberg and Daniel Day-Lewis, I became Mary. Daniel flew in from Ireland so that he and I could test. And then they both called me and said, will you be Mary? Early in the next Congress, when I tell you to do so, you will switch parties. Now, congratulations on your victory and get out. I knew that he was a radical Republican in the war. I didn't know much more about him than that. I knew that he was an abolitionist. Uh, when Stephen called and asked me to read the screenplay and, and, and if I would consider playing the part, I read the screenplay and immediately said yes. I'm just very happy to be part of that very fine undertaking. Tommy Lee Jones, who I've not worked with before, and apart from a shake of the hand, I'm not sure that we really had a conversation outside of the work, but he seemed so completely open and fluid and trustful of the work. And I'd say that was true of every working relationship in the film. The only reason they don't throw things and spit on me is because you're so popular. I can't concentrate on, on British mercantile law. I don't care about British mercantile law. When we were talking about the part of Robert Lincoln, it was Daniel Day-Lewis who right away said, I think Joe Gordon-Levitt would be an excellent actor to play my son in the movie. When they offered me the role, we had a little exchange via text message, which was a delight. He was such a sweet and generous guy with his words. But also, it's a little bizarre to be text messaging with someone that I've idolized for years. And it just meant a lot to me. I wanted to 
step into the 19th century and I wanted to make a film that represented as closely as possible the times and the mood of the nation, the mood of the individuals trying to solve these problems and trying to find these solutions. And I wanted to feel there was a real sense of authenticity on the set, where the only real imposition would be that there was a camera and there were monitors. The real opportunity and challenge for me as a production designer is that while it is a big story, it's being told intimately. It's very much, here's his world. Here's the White House, there's the entrance, there's his living quarters, here's the Congress. He'll travel through the streets in this way. And for me, the heart of the movie is his office, where he did most of his work as President of the United States. Oh, wow. Oh, look at this, and the maps. That kind of level of detail, whether it be a battle map or a little note or the wallpaper that we had to have created in the old fashioned way, exactly the way it was, the set decorator has just gone to extraordinary lengths to help make that as real and detailed as we possibly can. Here, here, here. A motion has been made to bring the bill for the 13th Amendment to a vote. Do I hear a second? I second the motion. So moved, so ordered. I think in the end, we had about 140 actors who had speaking parts on this film. It was a lot. It was really a lot. I don't know how we did it, actually. I gave one big presentation to Stephen of the colors, likening it to sort of hand-tinted photographs. And he liked all of that. He just wanted it to be realistic. And for Lincoln's clothing, I went with a very dark walnut brown, which helps depict the warmth of the man. And Daniel's physicality, is amazing. That hanging effect of the clothes across his shoulders. You feel the weight of the position he's in. Just this <laughs> once, Mrs. Lincoln, I demand of you to try and take the liberal and not the selfish point of view. Her costumes are just extraordinary. And we worked very, very closely because we wanted to have Mary's measurements. I'm exactly Mary's height, but the difference is that I gained 25 pounds to be Mary. Mary Todd loved purples, blues. Those were her main colors that she was very keen on. So I wanted a strength of color with this electric blue for the uh, reception scene at the White House. Almost all of Mary's costumes are exact replicas of the clothes that she was able to find in photographs or in paintings. I'm here to alert you boys that the great day of reckoning is nigh upon us. The movie takes place in 1860, so everything was lit with gas lamps or oil lamps. And particularly in this movie, I frequently follow the rules of naturalistic lighting. So if there are windows in the scene, then my light would come to the windows. If there is a lamp, I would create a light source coming from the direction of existing light source on the set. But immediately it was very clear to me that we should not do any specific color changes. We should just photograph it in the most beautiful, the most elegant way. So the photography was merely there to record the actor's work and the, and the screenwriter's uh, words. We begin with equality. That's the origin, isn't it? That balance, that's, that's fairness. Daniel DeLewis became the president, so the hair and the makeup, that's very essential because that's an exterior part of the president's appearance. Mr. Lincoln, at that point in, in time, obviously, he was under enormous stress. Therefore, we wanted that stress to come out on Daniel Day-Lewis's face. There were two people working on him, myself and Kenny Myers. And it's not a look-alike from a makeup perspective. It's much more a feel-alike. There was a point where we just stopped looking at all reference, and it was working with his face and then creating the feel of Mr. Lincoln. But there was never a day where my experience did not come to play on this film. When you look at the House of Representatives, we had 58 cast and 245 background, and 60% of them had facial hair. This is true collaboration between Stephen and I. He's a sophisticated storyteller. When he sees chances for good image, he will go for it. Stephen's got really good aesthetics, and so much about making movies is about good aesthetics and ability to tell the stories. I'd like your states restored to their practical relations with the Union immediately. Mainly, I think Stephen and I realized that you can't rush the cuts. You had to let somebody look. I like the eyes looking at each other. I love that, that when people look at each other, they feel it. 
if Lincoln would say something, I'd hold on him and he looks. And then we go to the Confederate vice president, he's looking. And so we didn't rush it. We, we gave people time to think about what they're seeing. And it was the way to work. It's not an action picture. Scenes play for long periods of time in one angle. I just wanted the scenes to exist in seemingly real time. And if I had gotten too fancy with too many reaction shots and too many cutaways, I think it would have taken away from some very complicated political points that Lincoln was trying to make. I use the law allowing for the seizure of property in a war, knowing it applies only to the property of governments and citizens of belligerent nations. The South ain't a nation. That's why I can't negotiate with them. So I needed the audience to lean forward, to pay utter attention to what was being said. And in order to do that, I didn't get fancy with the scissors or with the lens. We say all we've done is show the world that democracy isn't chaos. That there is a great invisible strength in a people's union. This was not something that required John Williams' music to necessarily set the pace of the drama. It needed to support the gravitas of what was being talked about. It was a very subtle job of scoring this movie. It's very different from my experiences with Stevens movies in the past years. For quite a few number of years now, I've been conducting the Chicago Symphony periodically, and everybody in the music world knows that Chicago Symphony is one of our greatest orchestras in the country and certainly one of the best in the world. And as we approach the time to make decisions about where, when, and how to do Lincoln, I think Stephen said, you know, wouldn't it be a great time to have your friends now at the Chicago Symphony perform? So we recorded at Symphony Hall in Chicago, and the performances are extraordinary, actually, personal and a very, very high artistic quality. It was wonderful that we were in Illinois with the orchestra because Illinois was the first state to ratify the 13th Amendment. So I thought that was a very nice spiritual connection. There's no recordings of the period at that time. Um, audio recording really wasn't invented until about 10 years after Lincoln was assassinated. And so I set about researching where are things that Lincoln actually heard? I very much wanted to get the sound of one of his watches ticking. And so I found the watch that Lincoln had in his pocket when he went to Ford's Theater. This was a watch given to Robert Lincoln after his father's assassination and was held by him for many years, given to a friend, and found its way into the Kentucky Historical Society just a few years ago. And so I sent Greg Smith, one of my recording partners, there to Kentucky to record the watch. And they let Greg record it the, the, from the front, from the back, they opened the watch up and he put a little tiny mic inside the watch. So we got it from every perspective. And uh, when I got those recordings back, it was really a thrill to, to know that this ticking was the sound that was around every time Lincoln was uh, probably alone in his office. Not quite sure what to do with yourself when it's finished. The investment has usually, for most of us, been a close to total investment of that period of our lives. But in this particular case, I felt two things at one and the same time. One was a sense of immeasurable uh, privilege at having been enabled to explore that man's life. And the other, as a result of that, was a sense of of great sadness and loss that, that that time allowed me was now over. Lincoln is relevant to the present because his presidency, I believe, offers the most vivid model of a leader, of leadership. And I've always believed that trying to make sense of what actually happened in the past always helps to shape our present. 
and that history is always relevant in the sense that understanding how we got to where we are will help figure out where we want to go from here. We here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth.